Welcome to our video. This is the sixth in a series on parallel chord truss geometries. In this case, we're going to be looking at two-way spanning systems. And among the topics that we're going to address is the design philosophy. Why would we actually want to do this? We'll define some of the common geometries. We'll talk about connections how systems are transported, uh, some geometric oddities, and then we'll have some architectural examples. If I can get my slides to advance. Okay, so we here we have a sort of common planar truss geometry. In this case, it's a series of rectangular bays that are spanning from columns on one side here to the other side. And you'll notice some cross bracing elements here, which is the common way that we stabilize these trusses against kicking laterally out from under the load. Um, and we do have to worry about that because the vertical elements in the webs are in compression and they are relatively unrestrained by most uh, truss geometries that we use or fabricational techniques. So we put in cross bracing uh, like this. This cross bracing starts to look like a truss almost in itself except there are no cord members and there are no supports at the end so it's not acting as a spanning systems. Um, we can intersect or interlace this kind of planar system. So here all we've done is replicated those trusses at 90 degrees so that they are intersecting and mutually bracing. So we eliminate the necessity for uh, this pure bracing elements and we have replaced them by really active spanning members. This only makes sense, of course, is we have the opportunity architecturally to provide supports such as these columns along all sides of this structure. This uh, produces a more efficient structure because um, we don't have pure bracing material. Pure bracing material is not particularly appealing to us because it has uh, it's generally zero force members, which are simply there to make some other members do some work. So that would be one of the primary philosophies um, to this mutual bracing system. Um, another is that localized forces get shared among many different trusses because instead of landing on one truss and putting all the burden on that, um, that truss immediately shares those loads off with adjacent trusses going in both directions. So let's ask ourselves under what conditions would we want to uh, explore this notion of two-way spanning. And one of the points is that it's only practical when the two spans and the two spanning directions are equal or approximately equal. And to illustrate that point, we've uh, mocked up in multi-frame uh, two intersecting trusses. One of them is a long truss. One of them is a short truss, each of which is supported by a column at each end. In this case, we're assuming that these two trusses are connected to each other at the center where they intersect, um, and that as a consequence at that point, they have equal deflections. In this particular truss, we treated them as if they don't actually intersect, and in a physical reality, we'd have to sort of have them slightly offset from each other at the center in order for them to move independently, but in a program like um, multi-frame, we can actually simply say they're not connected to each other, and the program proceeds to analyze them as if they're independent of each other. So in case B, we've described to multi-frame that they're not connected. 
in case A, they are connected. And then here you see the deflections or deformations. In the case A, uh, the two trusses have deflected the same amount at the center. In case B, they haven't. The much longer truss, which in this case is twice as long, has deflected 16 times as much um, or more, but it's, it's a, a very large ratio. Yes, and 16 is the answer. 16 times as much deflection. So what you have to conclude is that this long truss is, is much less stiff in carrying this load. And if, in fact, we insist that these two things move together, then that means, in fact, that this long truss is hanging on the shorter, stiffer truss and putting a much larger burden on it. So these are axial force diagrams. And what you'll note is that in case B, where the two trusses are independent of each other, um, the cord forces are very large in this long truss and they're not very large in the short truss. So the short truss is not only deflecting less, but it's much stronger or it has a much more efficient and stronger geometry and therefore the members could, under a given load condition, be much lighter. On the other hand, when we look at configuration A, where the two trusses have to deflect down together, you'll notice that the axial stresses in the short stress, truss are very high, and that's because the short truss is basically carrying uh, the burden of the long truss. And the long truss actually has smaller cord forces. Now you think this member right here is spanning the same distance from that point to that point, as the short truss is. So you'd think you'd see comparable axial forces here compared to the short one. But what's actually happening is we have continuity of this uh, long web member or the uh, long truss over that support and that is actually alleviating some of the force that would otherwise exist in the two parts of the long truss. But if we're going to summarize, what is the big picture discovery here? We discover that in fact, when the two members are connected together, the short span member is doing all the work and therefore there's really no point in having the long one. So over time, historically, people have concluded that if the two spans vary by more than a factor of 1.3, it is definitely not worth doing this. And generally speaking, most people agree that if the two spans aren't equal, they're not going to bother with all the complexities of intersecting trusses in order to uh, make this system work. So we need to say a few words about the philosophy of, of intersecting trusses and uh, complexities that have to do with connections. There was a ma major movement in the 50s and 60s to generate a universal joint and a universal member. There were many designs that were generated and they were all born out of the same motivation, which was a kind of erector set mentality. They wanted a simple kit of parts, like an erector set, that can be connected together to make a structure that grows in all three directions. The idea being that anyone with this kit of parts could produce a very complex piece of architecture with many different kinds of spanning conf configurations, and many different cantilevers and that the structure could be an incredibly creative structure because it could grow in all three directions. The problem with this concept is, first of all, it's not structurally that efficient. Um, the forces in the members and joints vary tremendously and if we design for the worst force that might exist, and that's how we define what our members and our joints are, uh, then 
throughout the truss, most of the members and most of the joints will be pretty drastically oversized. The joints are also much more elaborate than we normally find to be economical. And what we mean by that is all the cord members are continuous only from joint to joint. All their forces have to be transferred to a joint and then transferred to another cord member. Whereas in most economical linear trusses, we have continuous top and bottom cord members, which pretty uh, drastically enhances the structural performance and also simplifies the fabrication of the members. So, because of the extreme variability of the forces throughout the system, all of the successful schemes for space frames had to figure out a way to allow for several different member weights, and some even involved multiple weights for the joints. The resulting large inventory of parts undermined the elegance of the scheme and the economic potential of the system. In other words, no one ever actually came up with a universal joint and a universal member that could work for a wide range of, con of support conditions without having a lot of the members drastically oversized. Okay, so there, there have been a host of uh, concepts for what the joint should be. This is uh, something called a Miro space frame system. It consists of a cast steel nugget, um, which is the joint. The nugget gets drilled, then it gets threaded, and there's an end fitting on the members, which allows the members to have a threaded connection, which retracts into the member, the member's inserted, and then this hexagonal element allows that threaded end fitting, end connection, to go into this nugget. Um, it's pretty crucial that this threaded connection be able to retract into the member. Otherwise, you can have a very complex structure where one member gets damaged. And if you can't insert that member, you have something we call the last member problem, which is you can't get the member in or out without completely disassembling the entire structure back down to the point where the member needs to be replaced. So this Miro system was very clever. It has big enough tubes that they tend not to buckle. There's a tapered end fitting that allows them to um, to focus their stress lines into this nugget and if we didn't have this taper at the end, then the nugget would have to be very large. And then, as I said, there's this really clever threaded connection where there's, in essence, a bolt head inside of the member. That bolt head can be pushed back because it's spring-loaded. The member gets inserted. Then the spring tends to force the bolt into the hole. And then this hexagonal element is used to rotate that bolt into the hole in the nugget. And you can kind of see what that looks like up here. That's the threaded bolt. This is the hex piece, which by the way, allows this thread to retract back. So this head X hex piece is not integral to that threaded piece. It actually has a, a rod, a little stub that comes out of that. And you can see that stub right here. Uh, so you can see how the bolt can be retracted back in the slot. But that fin or that stub is how this hex piece actually generates torque that gets transferred to this threaded rod. The Miro was one of the most beautiful uh, and elegant solutions to this problem. But even then, this nugget had to be oversized for the worst load condition, and likewise they needed a variety of wall thicknesses for members. But they were able, with this connector system, to accommodate a large number of wall thicknesses, which allowed them to accommodate a range of forces in the truss. 
This, by the way, is a welded connection between this tapered end fitting and the tube. Um, a fairly elegant structural solution that uh, avoids the necessity of welding, but it has its limitations also, is something called swaging. So here is a cast end fitting that's inserted in a tube, and this end fitting has curved grooves all around it in two locations. And this whole assembly is put in a machine which rolls around a very uh, high stress material, which basically uh, presses this tubing down into that groove. Uh, this can actually develop the full strength of the member. Um, swaging is also used in things like plumbing, um, where we use brass swagings to to uh, seize against copper tube, and we can actually make a connection like that watertight. In this case, it was for structural purposes and not for containing water. So here's another kind of joint. Uh, basically, this joint was designed to allow continuous cord members in that direction, which reduces the number of members that have to be cut and allows us to take advantage of the continuity of those members. Um, on the other hand, you'll notice these members are very heavy. Uh, these cord members are relatively light. So in order for this to be a meaningful space frame, we'll have to conclude that the members going this way are spanning further than the members going that way. Otherwise, there would be no point in doing this. So this whole joint is more to seize upon the um, sort of the intrigue that people have with the geometry of the space frame than it is to be a practical solution. Okay, so we, uh, we looked at these interlacing trusses like so. Um, we're going to also propose an alternate geometry where we start with a bunch of a grid of cord members and then we're going to replicate these and then offset them so this set of cord members is this one right here and then there's a second one down below that's been offset by half a bay in that direction offset by half a bay that way and it doesn't extend as far to the right um, so this might be the, it is, the upper one, and then these are the lower cord members. And I'll show you some color images before too long that will help you understand that. But we'll lace those things together um, in this manner. And before I go too far on that, I'm going to uh, get out of PowerPoint and go look and what that geometry looks like. So this is green is the top cord, blue is the bottom cord, and all the web members are coming off at 45 degrees in plan to the joints. This is called an octet truss, by the way, and I'm gonna see if I can spin this thing around to help you understand. Um, this is a little slow because it's trying to render while I'm rotating it. This, by the way, is called an octet truss because of the following. Um, it has tetrahedra in it, so if you look at that element, that one, that one, that one, that one, and the one across the bottom, you'll see that you have two, four, six edges and four triangular faces. That's the classic uh, platonic solid that we call a tetrahedron. It's the minimal number of faces that you can have in, an, uh, in, a, in a solid where all four faces are the same. Those are all equilateral triangles. Now, you'll notice here you have a square uh, in the top chord and then uh, four members that come down to this lower point. Uh, and likewise, down on the bottom, we've got a square here with four members coming up to that point. 
So each of those is a square based pyramid where all the edge pieces are the same. Every member has the same length. So in this octet truss, every one of these members is four feet long the way this has been constructed, which is a, a pretty common dimension. Um, often space frames come in four, five, six, or eight feet, something like that. Now, this, if you took this pyramid and inverted it and combined the two of them together, you'd create something called an octahedron, which has eight triangular faces. And that octahedron is a very stable uh, geometric form also. So here we have an, a half an octahedron, and then here we have a tetrahedron. And those two things together fill the entire volume of this space lattice. And in fact, if we sort of mirrored this whole space lattice around this green, uh, we would produce full octahedra and tetrahedra in between. So we sometimes refer to this geometry as the octet geometry because it has octagons and tetrahedrons in it or octahedra and tetrahedra, I should say. And uh, it is the most common form of uh, space frame that has ever been developed. So that looks uh, something like this. In plan, it looks like that. In 3D, it looks like that. If we put two structures side by side, so here we have the octet truss. Here we have the interlaced planar trusses that we started with. If we ply a lateral load, so you notice we have cross bracing here, we have cross bracing there. We have it over on that side and we have it over on that side. So these lateral forces, which could be due to wind or could be seismic, are tending to warp the structure what you'll notice here is this is the deformation of the octet truss as compared to the interlaced planar trusses. So the octet truss has achieved good spanning depth, mutual bracing of all the trusses, but it's also doing something else that this system doesn't, which is it's achieving good diaphragm action. We're getting very little deformation here compared to the deformation there. So this has more complicated joints. This is much less effective, though, for certain types of structural functions. So jointery becomes really crucial in all this. And there's been a host of ideas that people have come forth with, uh, one of which I already mentioned was the Miro. Here's another that we use for the octet truss. Uh, this is called a, a unistrut, and I think they've been bought, and the name might have been changed, but you'll notice up here there was a square plate, so it would have had a point sticking out here and a point sticking out there. It has been forged into this new shape where it's still flat there along that top cord and flat along this one. You can see it's flat along that cord member there and flat along that one, but the corners have been bent down to engage these uh, diagonal web members. It's a, it's a very clever um, concept that starts with a simple flat plate and just uh, deforms it to make it conform to the direction of all the members that attach to it. Um, you would think that would be simple, but uh, there actually is all kinds of oddities involved here. For example, this little apparent punch is only halfway punched out, and it becomes a little shear element that allows this member to engage not just the bolt, but two of those um, little plugs that's a shear plug. So that reduces to a third the number of bolts that are necessary to get the shear connection out of that uh, connection between the plate 
and the diagonal web member. The problems start to emerge though when you realize that this plate is on the, um, the, the little plugs are punched downward. When you get here, um, this plate you might think is just that one turned upside down, but actually um, this is what I call an outbound plate and that's an inbound plate and that the little punched uh, shear elements are on the different side for this configuration compared to that. So, and if any of you want to look at that, I've got these kind of connectors and you can actually stare at them, but you almost have to have them in your hands. But, so then we got an inbound and an outbound plate, and then at, at an edge, uh, to keep the plate from just sticking out, it gets sheared off. So there's an edge plate, and then there's a corner plate, and then there's um, multiple plates where you have very, very high stress joints. So this system actually ends up involving a rather elaborate kit of parts. So in the end, the best system of this is still uh, the best that I've found is this Miro system. And by the way, the Miro system can do this planar truss arrangement, or it can do this octet truss. And in fact, if you vary the length of the members and you adjust the holes on this nugget, you can actually do all manner of curved uh, surfaces. And in fact, you can also do, uh, you can do geodesic domes and a variety of, the, of other types of structures. Uh, you can't do it with a standard nugget because these holes come off in a certain direction. Uh, and if you want a gentle curve or you want to do a geodesic dome, you have to specify the angle at which these holes get put into the nugget. But Potentially, it's extremely versatile, and this nugget is mounted on something we call an indexing head, and it's possible to computer drive that indexing head where all these holes are drilled at exactly the right angle. They're then threaded, and that member gets labeled for where it goes in whatever structure that you're putting it in. So this is an example of an octet truss. In this case, uh, they've actually used a double thickness of roof. So if you could go inside of this, you'd actually find full octahedra, and of course there are always full tetrahedra, um, to make up that structure. You'll notice that they have inverted that triangulation to create these legs. These legs, by the way, are great from a lateral stability point of view. This is like what I would call a super table leg model. Um, so under any kind of wind load, um, this uh, moment capacity where this inverted pyramid meets this truss work that's spanning across the roof, that moment capacity is fantastic for resisting horizontal forces. The big problem here is that as you go down, the number of members gets less and less and the members have to become much, much sturdier. So by the time you get to the bottom of this inverted pyramid, uh, these members are probably solid rods. <clears throat> okay, so here's uh, another example of an octet truss. Uh, this was at the Seville World's Fair, uh, and we have cord members spanning in that direction and cord members going that way. In this case, those members are not the same weight because this truss is not actually spanning the same distance. It, it has some odd boundary conditions having to do with this building interceding. Okay, so here is um, an octet truss and this is what it looks like from a distance and this is a similar type structure made out of exactly the same geometry uh, you'll notice this has been heavily tinted to shade the people underneath it this uh, building is this is a rooftop for the uh, uh, baltimore civic center which i think is a really wonderful civic building um, people go to conferences here, uh, they have exhibits here, 
and there are places to eat inside and then you can stroll out into this garden area and sit under these uh, shading elements and all of this is elevated above the street so it's it's quiet you don't have the um, vehicle traffic and people on the street walking through your space but you feel like you're part of a real city so this is another view of that same element you'll notice that one set at 45 degrees in plan to this one but they're very similar type structures and here you see above cord members running this way cord members running that way so here we have a cord member in there and again we see this is not the Miro nugget but it's a similar concept with a round nugget for the structure and this is what that looks like and by the way all this <laughs> this mesh up here is designed to keep birds off of the truss work because obviously nobody wants to sit and eat their lunch with pigeons overhead which is a a major issue that one always needs to think about when it comes to outdoor spaces uh, that are still architectural in nature. This is another view of that structure at a different angle. In, the, in this case, every one of these glazed elements is a, I think, an 8x8 acrylic um, pyramid. And this is another view. I just like the view. It shows these hero trusses, which are part of another part of the Civic Center. Uh, this is the octet space truss that we see up above, and some of the local architecture that's been uh, refurbished. There's a very nice blend of urban conditions here. This is the uh, Jacob Javits center in New York City. Um, it's basically a huge civic center. It's built totally out of octet truss and these odd facets that you see around here are just games that the designers played with um, the geometric and angular possibilities that are inherent in this extremely regular space frame. This is an interior view and you see cord members going this way and cord members going that way. And in this particular situation, you'll notice the ones going this way are lighter than the ones going that way because the spans involved um, are longer for this direction. But this is a very versatile structural system because it not only can span horizontally, it can span vertically. Uh, and in this case, it represents an excellent shear wall for resisting wind. So with a, with a single structural type, it's possible uh, to deal with all of those loading conditions. This is just another view. Again, you see the spherical connector, which is uh, the common way of uh, dealing with this kind of uh, space frame. And here you see the uh, horizontal cord members here and the vertical cord members there. And basically everywhere they have one of these pyramids they put in a square glazing panel and to reduce the spans in this case they run mullions down the middle. This is a view and here's an interesting point. All of these horizontal roof elements are octet truss, and all the walls are octet trusses. This space frame is spanning from this wall to this element right here, and that element is acting as a deep truss. It's because the octet truss has this diaphragm action. This effectively is a deep truss that's spanning from right there to right there. And it's kind of hard to see, but there's a support under that corner, which is similar in nature to this vertical support here. So key points in this structure are supported, but all the spanning elements that are taking all these extraordinarily complex loads, they are all basically octet trusses. And here are just a few more views of that space.
So, um, as I mentioned, one of the things you can do with this is you can put big holes in it because sometimes you need those for doors. And this structure can, this is a huge, deep truss. It's easily able to span from one side of this opening to the other. And this portion of the truck truss work basically spans from there up to there. And then this part spans off of that. So again, it's just a very versatile kind of structural system. Um, this shows a special glazing condition. You'll notice all the glazing in this building is highly tinted. Thank goodness, because otherwise during the summertime, the thermal load on this building would be incredible. In fact, it's, it is unbelievably high. Uh, but nonetheless, by tinting it, they have uh, reduced the impact. When I took this photograph, I got an exposure where all the stuff through the heavily tinted glass looks right. And then this view through the very transparent glass looks kind of burned out. When you stare at this wall, though, you tend to be drawn to this view and your eye adapts to that view. And then the rest of it is relatively dark. Uh, part of the way the reason they did this is they're trying to draw attention to the exits. So this is an exit and entry point, And they've used really clear glass. This is what that looks like outside. So people approaching the building, they see this clear glass. It gives them a much better view of the inside. And that's one of the signals that it sends uh, that this is an entry point. The other thing you'll notice is they've gotten a bit of overhang by taking advantage of the angular properties of this uh, space truss. Okay, now here's a building that has an octet truss, and clearly it's spanning in this direction, but it's also spanning in that direction. Uh, this was kind of a waste of material because they mainly did this, I think, because they thought the geometry was just really cool. Um, but there's way more material than needs to be there because the, the horizontal spanning portions have to go so far this is a classic example where this is the short span and this is the incredibly long span and there was no reason to do that. So what they could have done, by the way, is they could have left out all the web members going this way. So this is an example where we have uh, mutually braced trusses that we talked about previously. Um, and we just line those up side by side to back up this wall. This system still has good diaphragm action. It's just not spanning in this direction. It's only spanning from bottom to top. So good diaphragm action here. If you ever get to go visit the Air and Space Museum in Washington, you'll see a similar geometry with these uh, tubular triangular trusses, which are basically a variant of the octet, except they're only spanning in one direction. And in this case, they left out the ones in between. So in other words, they've only put truss work in front of one panel of glass, and they have an open panel of glass, and then another truss. And the reason they could get away with this in this building was they did not need diaphragm action. In other words, they didn't need for this truss to connect to that truss to create the wall diaphragm because they had this huge structure right here which handled any kind of wind loads in this direction. This is a view up showing one of those triangular cross-section and another one triangular cross-section truss or tubular truss and then the windows in between here um, were left open or free of structure because it wasn't necessary for diaphragm action. This shows how that joint is made by the way. Here we have a round tube. Uh, these are also round tubes. They have a simple miter right there and then at this interface this member has to be mitered uh, and coped into a curved angle. 
Okay, so we just talked about the Air and Space Museum where some of the members that we would normally think would be there get left out. Uh, in the case of the Air and Space Museum, we left out entire vertical bands of glazing. So in other words, here, uh, excuse me, truss work. So this band right here has no truss work. We lost our diaphragm action when we did that. We can retain our diaphragm action and still remove some members. So this is an example. Um, and I think I'm going to pull up multi-frame again so you'll kind of understand. But you'll notice in this case, uh, I'm going to treat these as the top cords in some kind of a roof. These represent, the red panels represent the opaque portion. Then there are openings in it. And when we turn that up and look, we've removed bottom cord members and web members that might have been blocking light coming down from here. And in fact, we're sort of indicating either that truss work could be open or we can coffer the ceiling by filling in these surfaces here if we want to run ductwork or wiring or something up there that we don't want people to see. So this is an example of what I call a sparse octet geometry. And I, I'll see if this image shows what can be done. We can run ductwork down here, but we don't want to run ductwork through here because we're running it through that coffered space that we're hoping to get daylight down through. This uh, model, by the way, is called Ramagon. Uh, I bought this 35 years ago or so, and now it's very brittle. Um, they quit manufacturing it before very long, and now it's a very expensive product that you can buy as a kind of antique. But I think it's a really beautiful model for expressing the nature of this geometry. You'll notice here I've made all the top cord members black, all the bottom cord members black, and then the web members white. Okay, so that looks something like this, and we're going to go to multi-frame, and we're going to take this particular geometry. So this is the full octet truss with all the members there, and then I'm going to go show you how we remove the ones we don't want. So I'm going to save this as, and I'm going to call this octet sparse, and I just put for the video, and say OK. And now I'm going to take this and I'm going to rotate it around. So uh, let me drag this down so that I'm in the window here. I hope I was in the window before when I was talking about all this. Um, so that's what the structure looks like. Um, in plan view, rendered. And I'm going to try this in the rendered form. But I'm going to basically go and I'm going to say there's a whole bunch of members I want to eliminate and I want to create a coffer and here's a bunch I want to eliminate and some more and some more and I'm going to hit delete and now you can kind of see I have half as many bottom cords as I have top in other words there are half as many of these blue as there are of the green and I'm reaching an odd condition now here where I had the wrong number of bays, but to just sort of clean this up and help you see what this looks like, I'm going to delete all of those. And now, if I kept this process up, I'm going to hold this shift key, and go down here, and delete a bunch more of these. And it starts to look like that. So over on this side, we have the complete space frame. Uh, over here, we have removed some members. Now, this actually works out pretty well because if 
um, we're spanning all the way from this side to that side and all the way from that side to over here. Well, just to keep this thing symmetric, I'm going to eliminate a few of those. If we're doing that, um, the bottom chord members are in tension, the top chord members are in compression, and they're also subjected to bending because the, the uh, external skin of the building presses down on them. So their stress condition or load condition is worse than for the members on the bottom. So it's not too bad that we have half as many members on the bottom as we have on the top. So I'm going to just sort of tilt this thing back a little bit and I'm going to rotate it so that you can kind of get a sense of what is going on in terms of this geometry. So you'll see here's an opening in the roof and then here's this coffered volume down below that lets the light penetrate down. Okay, so here are some physical models that we built a few years back that sort of illustrate this point. And that's the, another view of that geometry. And this is another model that we built, which basically has these intersecting triangular trusses with the coffered volumes down below the place where light is being emitted. So here we have an aperture, and here we have that coffered uh, surface down below it. And here's some coffering being put up there to obscure the structure and provide a nice white surface for uh, keeping the light moving down. And then this is what it looks like when that coffering is in every space. And then this is what it looks like when it's being daylit. And this is with some uh, simulated fluorescent fixtures. And here we weren't actually making them light, but we were trying to understand what they might look like in those volumes. And by the way, this is a great way to do daylighting because you, uh, if you have a big enough model, you can put your head up inside it and you get exposed to the true uh, luminous distribution in the space and you get a really good sense of when there's glare and, and how the system is working. Okay, so I want to draw your attention to the source of lateral stabilization. Here we have a pretty sturdy column. It's penetrating continuously through this joint. So we have a slightly better view of that here. And then additional members have been put in to stabilize the top. So this column has become a table leg. And this model was very sturdy. Uh, and this sort of illustrates that point because these walls, first of all, were not intended to be structural, but also uh, when we tilt this model under gravity load, this structure should want to go in that direction, but the moment capacity of these columns is preventing that from happening. But one of the sort of tricky things about uh, this space frame is that you have to go in and add some additional members, or you can have a column that comes down with four struts. So this point gets connected to the base and one there, and another one there and another one there. But that tends to take up floor space because the columns get in your way. But you need to think about how to do this. Okay, so relative to this issue, by the way, of apertures, um, if we look at this structure, you see that we have equal amounts of north, south, east, and west glazing. This actually is not too hard to regulate because during the summertime you just put a shade over the west side in the, the afternoon and a shade over the east glazing in the morning. Um, but this is not, from a pure passive point of view, the ideal uh, exposure for the glass. From a pure passive point of view, we'd like to not bother with the moving shades. And so one of the ways we can deal with that is we can remove even more of the, uh, the webbing and the cord numbers down below. 
So here's an example where somebody's done that. They didn't actually put apertures in these openings. So this might be a south glazing and a north glazing on that edge. And then we'd have a, a roof on top of it. Not unlike this opaque roof on the top here. Um, in the case of this structure, they just did it because they felt like it looked nicer and certainly it was more than adequate. So you'll notice that in this case, um, three of the uh, structural tubes that would be going across here uh, have been removed or at least uh, we've interrupted two of the top cord members. So we remove these top two cord members and removed a bunch of web members um, and the structure still works fine. This also is part of the Baltimore Civic Center. And by the way, this shows some more of the joinery where this is mitered and this connection is mitered and um, coped and it's all welded together. And then these plates have been welded in and they have some structural function, but they are mainly there to contain the light bulbs that shine up and illuminate this structure. This is kind of grainy close up of one of those joints. And here's another one. It gets kind of congested in there. So these members have got to be cut with very complex end cuts. Again, these are mitered and coped to curve to face up against this cord member. And then these connections are just mitered. Okay, if we make um, a truss work deep enough, we can actually inhabit the truss work. So this is a classic technique that's used at airports. In this case, uh, it's O'Hare. And here we have a worn truss along each side, which is very nice because we get light and view through both sides. And then the tube is stabilized laterally by the diaphragm action of this roof and by the diaphragm action of this concrete floor. And so vertical planar trusses work really well in this situation. Um, but sometimes people get excited about the idea of can we inhabit an octet truss. So here we have the Portland version of the World Trade Center. It's much more modest in scale, but beautiful and elegant. And here you see back, actually, this is the octagon. So here we have the square. And we have the inverted pyramid part of it and the regular pyramid part of it. And so you see four triangular faces right here. All of these are triangular and all of these are triangular. They make the octet of the octet truss. So you come approach this thing and this is what it looks like. And then once you've gone up the escalator, here we are inhabiting the octet truss um, and the geometry is a little confused by this one member here which is not a part of the normal geometry but here you see the square and more squares out there um, and then we have squares up in the roof and the weather is really quite benign and gentle there so um, these spaces, when I was there, were really quite comfortable, even though uh, this is all open to the outside air. So, one key thing you'll notice, this railing is pushed out into the space. That's to keep people from whacking their heads on these slope members. So you do have to think through fairly carefully how people live within triangulated volumes. And uh, this, of course, is pre-cell phone. But you can imagine people walking along here, reading their cell phones and being um, frequently knocking themselves out on these diagonal members. This connection, by the way, I really love this connection because it's so simple. Let me see if I can show this to you. So this is a steel cube down below. And the corners of the steel cube are very strong. 
The steel cube has been rotated 45 degrees to the geometry of the structure and that edge of the steel cube is where this plate has gotten welded. And by the way, we've used a torch to slice both sides of this tube. We insert this plate and then we weld it all along that seam. And then that gets continuous through welding to the corner of the uh, cube. And this shows that detail from down below at the base. So we have steel plate here, we have a horizontal steel plate on the top. And those steel plates have to be strong enough. And you'll notice something else. This face is vertical, the top face is horizontal. They come to an edge and this member doesn't even have to be uh, cut in any unusual way because it provides an opportunity to weld in that crack and to weld into the crack in the top. So this very complex geometry has been achieved by what is a very simple joint. So this is that cube and the edges of the cube receive these members and the edges receive all of these web members also. It's hard to believe that this octet geometry, which seems so complex to us, can be mediated by a simple cube. Pretty amazing. Some really ingenious thinking there. And by the way, all this stuff gets pre-welded up, and you'll notice that's where the field connection occurs. So there's nobody out in the field welding this complex joint. It's all being done in a factory where this thing is supported by a jig. A jig is something we use to hold things very tightly in the right geometry until we get them welded up correctly. And then all that gets transported to the field, and the field connections are actually pretty simple. You'll do notice that they did make a weld in the flange here because they wanted to have some moment capacity in this, but it's a pretty simple field connection. Okay, so this is our octet geometry again. And uh, you'll notice in this case, as we've said repeatedly, these top and bottom cords have these square facets. This overall geometry, though, is part of something we call a space-filling geometry. And this, these, these octagons, octahedra and tetrahedra, can be nested together to fill all of space. And this, by the way, is called a Rutherford solid after Lord Rutherford, who conducted this experiment where he put a bunch of um, lead bead in a close pack pattern in a volume, and then he proceeded to compress it. And this shape is what came out of that experiment. But the Rutherford solid uh, and this lattice that's associated with it makes two fairly distinct forms. If you look at this square face, and then you look at this square pattern, that's the classic octet truss that we've been looking at so far. It has square faces on the top cord and square faces on the bottom cord. In this case, we've taken this Rutherford solid and we've rotated it where those elements are in the vertical plane. And now we are, well, actually, they're not even exactly that. But they're not in the horizontal plane. The horizontal plane now consists of this hexagon with equilateral triangles all through it. And then the next plane down is also a hexagon, and it also has triangles in it. So we can slice this and make a space frame which all has all triangular top and bottom cords. Now, there are two reasons we might want to do this. One is, if you look at this structure, it has great diaphragm action. It has good spanning capacity in both directions. The one thing it's not very good at is it doesn't have torsional capacity. So if I came and removed one of these columns, that tip would flex down rather badly. And that has to do with the fact that these squares are not fully triangulated. On the other hand, if we go to the slice we just talked about, 
the entire top chord and the entire bottom chord are fully triangulated and so this has marvelous torsional capabilities. So that geometry is basically we take this pattern of triangles, we replicate it, put it down below, offset it in the following way. So this diagram doesn't have any of the web members lacing the two layers together yet. Uh, it just shows the top and bottom cord. But if we lace them together in plan, it looks like this. And in a 3D view, it looks something like that. So I'm going to explore that further, but I'm going to make a quick comment here before I go look at multi-frame. Um, this college had a long tradition of doing hyperbolic paraboloids, geodesic domes, and space frames. And there's a very famous space frame hanging on the wall uh, down in the breezeway between the Matsumoto Wing and Brooks Hall. And this is that space frame. It consists of quarter inch rod, which has been welded together. And by the way, it was pretty carelessly welded together because when you look at it, um, you'll notice the levels don't intersect. So we have cord members going this way and cord members going that way. And they are continuous and they just get welded. So in most structures, we try to make the center points of all those members meet. But in the case of this truss, um, the students who put it together were in kind of a hurry and they said, oh, we're not going to worry about that offset too much. And they welded it up. And I wish I could find the image of it because when you go look at this, you'll see it's a fairly big space frame. It was originally set horizontally and it was, even now, it's only supported at three points. Um, and it was supported at three points and then there were like 15 students that stood on it. And the fact that they could do that speaks to the wonderful torsional properties of this because it was only supported at three points. So that issue of torsional strength is a, another major motivation or one of the major motivations for using this kind of uh, triangulated top and bottom cord pattern. Um, <clears throat> there's another reason to do it which is that occasionally we just want some kind of triangular structure. So let me go to multi-frame here for a moment. And I'm going to pull up the structure that I want to look at. And I have to position this so that you can see it. up. So this is that triangular pattern and in this case again green is the top chords, red is the web members, and blue are the bottom chords. And uh, it turns out that this particular uh, space truss lends itself really well to uh, triangulation. So I'm going to just save this off and I'm going to call it junk just you know because I already have this in another form um, so I'm going to call it that and now I'm going to come along here and I'm going to say you know there's a nice triangular patch right there that I'd like to use so I'm going to just lasso all of this and I'm going to get rid of it and then I'm going to rotate this thing around. And I think I need to rotate it like this. This may not have been what I intended to do, but it's working fine. So now I have this beautiful triangular space frame which might be useful in some kind of an architectural situation. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Let me just rotate this. So 
so that you kind of can get a sense of what the structure looks like. These are the kind of things, by the way, boy, it really helps just to have a 3D model of this. Because sometimes looking at this in the computer can be terribly confusing. But I think that view gives you a pretty decent sense of what this geometry is. I think it's very elegant. Okay, so here's a project that I worked on years ago. It was um, intended to be an IMAX theater down in Dade County in uh, Florida. And we knew that we wanted it to have roughly this shape. So this surface was rectangular and we basically used a square faced octet truss on that portion and then we use the triangular octet truss here. And you'll notice we warp these, these triangles a little bit. They're not exactly equilateral because the driving issue had to do with what does the geometry of this interior space need to be in terms of what is the slope of the seating and uh, what kind of volume do we need for acoustics and so forth. Um, but we were able to seamlessly mesh along this edge that triangular geometry and the square faced geometry on that side so this triangle is an example of that triangulated face uh, space truss which uh, is the perfect solution to this particular geometry here's another one this is a triangular structure at disney world and i regret that somehow when i was there i didn't take the picture from the right angle, but this is basically a pyramid. It's a square based pyramid with three triangular faces and you can't quite grasp that right now because the uh, pyramid is cut into at the corner by all this other structure. So I really needed a photograph in the other direction so that you can understand it. But you get the gist of it that each of these is a triangular face and basically you'll notice the triangular facet geometry that's being used in this structure. And this is a close-up of, uh, actually I don't think it is the joint in that structure. Okay, so here's another really exceptional piece of architecture by Annie and Pei. This is the east wing of the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. And if you ever go to Washington, D.C., you need to go to the National Building Museum and to the east wing of this National Gallery because they are both exceptional pieces of architecture with wonderful uh, grand interior spaces and also really exceptional examples of daylighting in the case of the National Building Museum and this kind of triangulated truss work in the case of the east wing of the National Gallery. So when you go in the National Gallery, you look up and you see the triangulated bottom cord members and in this rather hazy form you can see the ones above. And by the way, the reason this is hazy is that each of these facets is filled with stainless steel rods. And those rods are about three quarters of an inch in diameter and they have a small spacing between them to admit the daylight. So the rods are kind of rejecting some of the daylight. They're bouncing it off in other directions. And, uh, but they're also letting some beam sunlight through. So it's a really, uh, from a thermal point of view, this is still not a good design at all. Um, but from a lighting design point of view, it's pretty interesting because it lets in a lot of diffuse light, but it lets in just enough beam sunlight that the building functions as a pretty good sculpture space. The diffusing of the light reduces some of the glare, but there's still enough directionality to the light that you could appreciate some complex uh, 3D sculptural form uh, because there is some directionality to the light. One of the curious things is that these rods, if you tried to use rods like that and you were say trying to read a book up close to such a structure 
it would drive you insane because there would be bands of extreme brightness and then bands of relative uh, low luminosity. And so it wouldn't be very good from a, from a sort of functional point of view or from a sort of glare and discomfort point of view. However, these uh, grates or these uh, steel rods are high enough up that the sunlight, which is not perfectly parallel, uh, very quickly blurs. In other words, it spreads and the bright spots of beam sunlight sort of re-merge into each other. So that by, by the time you get down to the bottom of the space, you get no banding of the light. So this just shows you those rods a little better. This is uh, near sunset and you see a very different kind of uh, light quality. And uh, I also wanted to show you this because this is the connector. And these connectors, by the way, were monster huge. They weighed 10,000 pounds each. Uh, I think this structure could have been built a lot a lot more efficiently in fact I'm sure it could have um, on the other hand when you are doing such an incredibly important building like the East Wing of the National Gallery people don't worry about a few hundred tons of steel in terms of the cost of the building so uh, somewhere I have a bunch of really beautiful photographs of this building unfortunately these were the only three I could find on short notice but this is a very tall space, so it goes down uh, two more levels down here. But the light quality everywhere in this is truly wonderful. So that concludes our video on two-way span parallel core geometries. Uh, focusing on interlaced planar trusses and octet trusses. And the octet trusses are very good from a point of view of not only spanning in two directions, but also diaphragm action. But they also have complexities that cause them to be more expensive, like you have to do six-way joints like this, or actually this is more than six, six ways when you account for all the web members. So these are actually steel castings. They're quite expensive. And this is one of the burdens of doing space frames. So you should be aware that when you get into this, you need to do some clever thinking. Uh, an example of which would be the World Trade Center that I showed you in Portland, where they used a simple uh, welded up cube to mediate all the different directions of all the members.